Welcome to Megaten. I am Monica. And I am David. A quick reminder, please give us a like, hit the bell, and subscribe to our channel. Thank you for being here and supporting us. Hey Monica, this one's going to be heavy. We're talking about Ripple's OCC Charter, something that could quietly redefine the entire U.S. financial system. Yes, David. It's not just another regulatory filing. Ripple's National Trust Bank Charter could be the first time a blockchain-native institution actually becomes part of the federally chartered banking system. The ripple effect of that, no pun intended, could be enormous. Right. The official name they filed under is Ripple National Trust Bank. And if this gets approved, it's not like a normal bank. It's a limited-purpose trust bank. That means no deposits, no loans, but full fiduciary powers. They can custody assets, manage reserves for stablecoins, and operate across all 50 states under OCC oversight. The real game changer is that this pushes the boundary between fintech and federally regulated banks. For years, fintechs like Ripple or Circle had to deal with a patchwork of state money transmitter licenses. Now, a federal trust charter means preemption, one license, nationwide operation. Right. The official name they filed under is Ripple National Trust Bank. And if this gets approved, it's not like a normal bank. It's a limited-purpose trust bank. That means no deposits, no loans, but full fiduciary powers. They can custody assets, manage reserves for stablecoins, and operate across all 50 states under OCC oversight. The real game-changer is that this pushes the boundary between fintech and federally regulated banks. For years, fintechs like Ripple or Circle had to deal with a patchwork of state money transmitter licenses. Now, a federal trust charter means preemption, one license, nationwide operation. Exactly. And the legal foundation for that came from OCC Interpretive Letter 1176 back in 2021. It clarified that national trust banks could perform non-fiduciary activities like payment processing. So this isn't coming out of thin air. It's built on legal precedent. Still, this marks a new category, what people are now calling blockchain native banks. Anchorage Digital was the first to get a national trust charter back in 2021, but Ripple's case is bigger because of the scale of its network and its connection to RUSD, its stablecoin. And that's the key point. RUSD isn't just another stablecoin. It's regulated by the New York Department of Financial Services already, but this charter would let Ripple put the reserves directly under a federally supervised entity. If they also secure the Federal Reserve Master Account, they could hold those reserves at the Fed itself. That's an entirely different level of trust. That would remove the reliance on commercial banks for custody. Instead of keeping reserves in partner banks like BNY Mellon used to, Ripple National Trust Bank could hold funds directly in the Fed's books. That eliminates it's counterparty risk. And the OCC isn't just going to hand that over. Remember what happened with Custodia Bank's application? They were denied a master account even though they had a state charter. The Federal Reserve uses a three-tier risk review framework. Ripple is going to face a tier two review, meaning they'll be heavily scrutinized for operational and systemic risks. True, but Ripple's in a stronger position than Custodia because it's pairing the OCC charter with an already active New York license. The dual oversight model actually helps. It shows both federal and state-level supervision. Brad Garlinghouse even called it a benchmark for stablecoin trust. It's smart positioning, because once RUSD's reserves are under a federal charter, it falls under banking regulation, not securities or commodities laws. The Genius Act, passed this summer, codified that distinction. OCC-chartered stablecoins are banking products not investment securities. That could clean up Ripple's compliance posture after years of regulatory uncertainty. The XRP case with the SEC might have damaged their reputation, but this move signals maturity. It's a way to ring fence risk, separate the stablecoin business from the token business, and show regulators that they can play by banking rules. Let's be clear, though. This doesn't automatically resolve XRP's regulatory status. XRP will still live in that patchwork world. Courts already ruled it's not a security in retail sales, but is in institutional ones. But Ripple's Trust Bank doesn't need XRP to be a security or a commodity. It can simply use it as a bridge asset in payment flows. And that's where things get interesting. If Ripple National Trust Bank gains Fedwire and FedNow access, you could see transactions on the XRP ledger settling directly into the Fed's payment rails. Imagine sending RUSD from Tokyo to New York, and within seconds, the recipient's bank account is credited through FedNow. That's direct settlement between blockchain and central banking infrastructure. The systemic implications of that are enormous. It removes the need for correspondent banks and overnight clearing. Liquidity could move 24-7. Cross-border payments, which normally take two days, could close in seconds. 
and Ripple's already proven it with its on-demand liquidity corridors. But let's talk about the opposition, too. The Independent Community Bankers of America and the National Community Reinvestment Coalition filed objections. They argue that granting these charters allows fintechs to enjoy banking privileges without community obligations. Because trust banks don't take deposits, they're exempt from the Community Reinvestment Act. Yeah, that's a fair concern. Traditional banks are required to reinvest in local communities. Trust banks skip that. So critics see this as regulatory arbitrage. They get federal preemption, access to the Fed, and the branding of a bank without bearing all the public interest responsibilities. Yet the counterpoint is that these aren't retail banks. They're infrastructure providers. Ripple isn't taking your paycheck deposits. It's operating the plumbing of the digital financial system. And in that context, the charter makes sense. Another worry is systemic risk. If a major portion of payment activity starts moving on public blockchains like XRPL, any technical glitch or exploit could cascade through the banking system. The OCC and Fed are wary of that, so Ripple will need to demonstrate top-tier cybersecurity and operational resilience. That's why the OCC requires enhanced capital buffers for these trust banks. Since they don't take deposits, their capital adequacy is based on custodial assets and operational risk. Ripple will need to maintain higher capital ratios to offset potential blockchain-related incidents. Let's zoom out to what this means for the broader industry. If Ripple succeeds, Circle will follow. Paxos has already applied. Coinbase is considering it. And once one of them gains approval, others will rush in. We could be seeing the birth of a regulated class of blockchain-native financial institutions. Exactly. Think of them as the new generation of non-depository banks. They'll manage tokenized deposits, stablecoin reserves, and digital asset custody under federal supervision. It's like when the internet birthed online banks. Now we're seeing blockchain-only banks. The competitive response from incumbents will be interesting. JP Morgan's already testing deposit tokens. Cities running pilot programs with tokenized treasuries. BNY Mellon is expanding digital custody. But if Ripple gets its Fed access, they'll have something even these giants don't direct blockchain to Fed settlement. And that's where competitive pressure comes in. It could pressure them to accelerate their own digital transformations. Jamie Dimon might not like crypto speculation, but he knows the technology isn't going away. JP Morgan's Onyx division already runs JPM coin for institutional payments. The difference is Ripple's model is open and interoperable. Yes, Monica, this is bigger than one company. We're witnessing convergence. Payment processors, stablecoin issuers, and regulated banks are merging into a unified system. The Genius Act formalized that trajectory. It's the U.S. way of countering China's digital yuan and Europe's MICA framework. The geopolitical layer is fascinating. China's Project Embridge is testing wholesale CBDCs between central banks. The EU is moving ahead with a digital euro. The U.S. isn't issuing a CBDC yet, but by giving bank charters to private stablecoin issuers like Ripple, it achieves the same thing, digitizing the dollar through the private sector. Quick reminder, remember to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you. That's a brilliant workaround. Instead of government-issued digital currency, you get a regulated private one, still fully under federal oversight. And it keeps the U.S. dollar dominant in digital finance. RLUSD could become a digital dollar export tool. Yes, and that's exactly why other countries are watching this. If the OCC approves Ripple, it sets a global template. Other regulators could adopt similar frameworks. Imagine Singapore or the UK granting blockchain trust bank charters. That would spread U.S. financial influence through regulation rather than force. But there's still the Basel III issue. Under those capital rules, crypto assets are split into two groups. Group 1 includes tokenized traditional assets and stablecoins with robust backing. Group 2 includes volatile tokens like XRP or Bitcoin. Group 2 assets carry a 1,250% risk weight. That means if Ripple holds XRP on its balance sheet, it must back it fully with capital which means they'll minimize direct XRP exposure. The trust bank will probably hold only RLUSD and traditional assets. XRP's role will remain transactional as a bridge currency rather than a balance sheet item. That keeps regulatory capital requirements low. It also strengthens RLUSD's position as the core liquidity instrument. Right now, its supply is under a billion, but that could change quickly if institutions adopt it. Once it's backed by federal oversight, RLUSD could become the de facto settlement token for fintechs and digital asset platforms. And this plays right into Ripple's long-term strategy. They're not chasing retail hype anymore. They're building infrastructure for banks, fintechs, and payment processors. In that ecosystem, speed, compliance, and stability matter more than speculation.
that's a critical shift. It's not about replacing banks. It's about integrating blockchain into banking. We're moving from competition to convergence. And convergence means we'll start seeing hybrid products, tokenized deposits, programmatable money, real-time treasury management. For example, JP Morgan's tokenized deposit program on Coinbase's base chain shows what's coming. Ripple could do the same on XRPL. There's also the matter of risk management. OCC-regulated banks must implement rigorous AML and KYC frameworks, but blockchain transparency makes this both easier and harder. Easier because every transaction is traceable. Harder because pseudonymous addresses blur identities. Ripple will need to implement on-chain compliance tools like wallet whitelisting, real-time analytics, and smart contract-based transaction filters. These could become new industry standards. It's the marriage of blockchain openness and banking discipline. And that might lead to a new class of reg tech. Imagine banks using Ripple's compliance APIs for on-chain risk scoring. We're seeing the emergence of programmable regulation which, ironically, could make the financial system more secure than it is today. Automated compliance, auditable ledgers, instant settlements, these reduce human error and delay. Still, the privacy issue won't go away. Public ledgers expose transaction data. Ripple National Trust Bank will need to keep customer identity mapping off-chain to comply with OCC and privacy laws. That's a major architectural challenge. Zero-knowledge proofs might help there. Verifying compliance without revealing private data. If Ripple implements those, it could set a new model for privacy-preserving finance. Let's not forget international trade implications. If Ripple gains Fedwire access, companies could settle invoices directly in RLUSD instead of SWIFT messages. Cross-border liquidity management could become real-time. That's transformative for corporates. And that reduces reliance on Nostro accounts. Right now, banks pre-fund billions in foreign currencies for liquidity. A blockchain network with tokenized assets could eliminate that need. It's capital efficiency at scale. But that also means regulators will need to update liquidity frameworks. If money moves 24-7, traditional overnight liquidity models don't apply. The Fed and BIS will have to adapt. The BIS already flagged this. In their August paper on DLT and capital markets, they warned about continuous settlement altering monetary policy transmission. With blockchain, liquidity never sleeps. Which brings us to monetary policy. If stable coins like RLUSD hold reserves at the Fed, interest rate changes could flow directly into those tokens. That might actually improve policy transmission, but it could also disrupt banks' role in that mechanism. And that's why the Fed is cautious. They don't want to lose control over monetary levers. Approving Ripple's master account could shift parts of money supply management into private hands. Back to the analysis, one overlooked dimension is systemic interoperability. Ripple's charter doesn't just connect with the Fed, it bridges with global payment systems. Swift, for instance, is launching its own blockchain-based shared ledger with consensus and over 30 global banks. That's a fascinating dynamic. Swift is no longer competing with blockchain, it's joining it. Their ISO 20022 messaging standard can already carry blockchain references. So we might see RippleNet and Swift coexist rather than collide. Which would be ironic because Ripple started as Swift's challenger, but coexistence could actually drive adoption faster. Banks could use Swift for messaging and XRPL for settlement. That dual stack model, traditional messaging with blockchain settlement, could become the global standard. It preserves compliance while delivering instant transfers. The OCC's decision will be pivotal. They're reviewing the application under control number 2025 Charter 342347. The public comment period ended in early August, and the final decision could come before year end. Investors should mark that down. Yes, and even if approved, Ripple would still need separate Fed approval for the master account. That could take months or longer, depending on policy climate. The outcome of the Custodia litigation might set precedent. Quick reminder, remember to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you. So we could see 2026 as the first operational year of Ripple National Trust Bank. That's when we'll truly know if blockchain native banking is viable inside the U.S. regulatory perimeter. And it's not just the U.S. watching. Europe, Singapore, and Hong Kong regulators are studying this model. If it works, they might replicate it. The world's financial architecture could evolve around U.S.-style blockchain trust banks. Yes, David. What I find most remarkable is how this blends Silicon Valley innovation with Main Street banking. It's a coexistent story, not a disruption one. Agreed. Ripple isn't trying to overthrow banks. It's becoming one. And that's the real paradigm shift. Once blockchain firms start living inside the banking perimeter, the narrative changes from crypto versus banks to crypto as banks.
and the implications stretch beyond finance. It's about trust, governance, and sovereignty in a digital age. The more digital our money becomes, the more critical these regulatory frameworks are. Which is why this charter debate matters. It's not just about one company. It's about setting the rules for the next century of money movement. Ripple's journey from being sued by the SEC to applying for an OCC charter is symbolic. It shows evolution from regulatory conflict to compliance leadership. Exactly. It's the maturation of an industry, from fighting for legitimacy to designing the next layer of the financial system. Let's wrap up by looking at what could happen if this model succeeds. Ripple National Trust Bank could become the prototype for digital asset banks worldwide. RLUSD could standardize stablecoin trust structures. And the U.S. could reassert financial leadership through innovation, not prohibition. But if it fails, it might delay blockchain integration by years. Regulators could retreat and banks would double down on legacy rails. The stakes are high. For investors and analysts watching this, the key dates ahead are the OCC's charter decision and the Federal Reserve's response on master account access. Keep those noted. These will define the landscape for years to come. Whatever happens, it's clear the future of money is programmable, auditable, and interoperable. And Ripple's move is a milestone on that path. Drop comments below and subscribe to our channel. David and I are personas to make content more engaging and relatable, not legal and financial advice. Do your own research before making any investment decisions. By the way, if you're studying financial innovation, pay attention to how regulatory definitions evolve. The first step toward new opportunities is understanding the language regulators use to describe change. See you next time.